Hello and welcome to Livewise by Hold Cell. I'm Ali Selby and today we are talking about a topic which divides the market. I'll give you a hint, it's shorting. And who better to discuss this subject than two long short managers themselves? I'm joined by Anthony Abood from Perpetual and Sage Capital's Sean Fenton. Sean, I'll start on you. In your opinion, what is the role of shorting in markets and why do you think it sometimes has that bad reputation? Well, yeah, it clearly gets a bit of a bad rap because most people are long equities um, in general and they like to see the equity market go up. So there's a bit of a, a false perception there that shorting pushes down share prices, it's bad for markets. Um, but I think that feeds into as well, what is its role, what does it do, what benefit, benefits does it bring? What it really brings is uh, flexibility and, and potential to do different things. So it's the ability to yeah, profit from um, stocks underperforming the market, uh, or falling in absolute sense, providing protection to portfolios in, in certain areas. Uh, but the ability to go both long and short increases an investment manager's opportunity set to do different things. Anthony, I've read that people call short sellers almost like market, the market policemen, mm. um, helping to keep valuations in check. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, they, they offer price discovery. Um, now, obviously, they get a bad rap. I mean, a lot of these sort of short reports which have come out some of them much better than others. A lot of them are quite, you know, quite poor, to be honest. But um, for me, I don't mind that on the long side because if someone's come out with a few angles on the, uh, you know, in a short report about a stock I'm long, I sort of like that, right? Because it, cause I, um, cause they're free of charge, giving me some angles which I may not have thought, thought of on the, uh, on the risk side. And if they're, uh, if they're wrong, well, they've pushed the share price is lower and I get to buy the stock at a cheaper price. So. Yeah, they offer a value manager, they're a value manager's best friend at times. <laughs> Is it possible you could take us through some of the, the benefits of shorting? Mm -hmm. Well, from a portfolio, I think Sean mentioned this, uh, from a portfolio management perspective, markets don't always go up. Um, and there's alpha to be generated both on the long and the short side. Yes, markets have gone up for the last 12 years, you know, apart from short periods of time, mm. but that may not be the case for the next 10 years. Yeah, would you agree? Are there any other benefits you'd like yeah, to definitely. tell us about? Well, people use it in different ways. The way we use it at, at Sage is to really um, focus down on our investment skills and our, and our process. So we use it to really identify what we're good at, the company fundamentals, the earnings, where they're going to be going. So we want to be long companies with um, you know, solid earnings profiles, good businesses that are growing and, and short companies that are under pressure falling earnings, but there's a whole lot of other things driving through the markets. And the long short structure means that you can strip out some of those risks and really just allow your investment process to shine through. Okay, we've talked a little bit about the pros. Can you take us through, I guess, some of the costs that are involved with shorting? Yeah, the, the costs are, are reasonably straightforward. So there's clearly stock borrow costs. So in Australia in particular, everything's covered um, short selling. So you've got to borrow the stock off someone else, generally a super fund that's lent it out. Uh, that varies. It's generally not a, a huge cost. It's an annual cost of keeping that short position in place. And you basically enter in, into a contract with that fund. So you make them good for anything that happens. So if the stock pays a dividend, uh, you pay that dividend back to the, the owner. Uh, it gets a little bit more complicated if you get some um, stock issues and the like. But uh, they're, they're the main costs. Are there any further costs you'd like to add? Well, the biggest cost is getting it wrong. Uh, <laughs> no, being serious. True, I mean, yeah. that's, that's the biggest cost to uh, any, any short position and the one, th the one thing which people don't really focus on enough is that when a short goes wrong it becomes a bigger part of your portfolio, harder to manage um, and whereas a long goes wrong it, it sort of becomes a smaller part of your portfolio you can say okay well, we can look at that I got the timing wrong. I can look at that in a few years' time. Yeah, well it reminds you of what happened with GameStop over Absolutely. the year. Absolutely. For me you've got to be very careful of obvious shorts and that's something which we saw with, uh, with GameStop is being leveraged into an obvious short is a very dangerous game. What are the factors that you look for when assessing opportunities in shorting? Uh, is there like a filtering system that you use or are you actively going out looking for poorly managed companies or for over, overvalued companies? How does it actually work? Uh, sort of all the above, um, yeah. Ali. The, um, the things we, we look for is we, we sort of identify through red flags, looking for where either inside is selling, a CFO suddenly le leaving, a str I call it a strange acquisition for diversification or for, you know, whether it's just complete change of strategy for a company, uh, funny accounting, uh, and then when a CEO's out there berating analysts for uh, putting a sell recommendation on there, uh, you know, that's always a red flag as well. So you look at all those red flags and then, then we go out in the field and talk to people in the industry and then work out uh, which companies are, you know, we think are, are, are vastly overvalued 
and um, that we've got an angle which the market doesn't is not on top of. Diversification and red flags. What about you? What do you yeah. use? Is it a different strategy? We're, we're pretty symmetric the way we look at things. So you know, we break the market down into to broader groups of stocks, things like cyclicals and growth stocks and resources and um, and yields, financials and the like. We really look for the best and worst stocks within those groupings. So. As I mentioned before, we're very focused on company earnings, um, you know, both long-term structural drivers and, and things like company management and incentive structures and everything. And we have a valuation overlay. So for us, an investment decision is always a trade-off between um, the growth potential what the company is delivering and, and where it's valued. And uh, we apply that process across the market. And our shorting is pretty symmetric. So the, the worst uh, ranked companies on that uh, growth value trade-off uh, short candidates and uh, long candidates for uh, the best ranked ones. Are there any um, tools or techniques that you would recommend individual investors use if they want to try this out? Uh, to, to try it, shorting depends what the objectives are. Um, if they're looking for, for downside protection uh, across the market or uh, some of their big stock holdings and put options can be, uh, can be an option. Um, literally, uh, although the market's pretty limited in Australia to some of the larger cap companies, there are retail products out there like warrants that um, uh, there are put warrants available, which will uh, allow investors to benefit. There's con contracts for difference. Uh, similarly, um, obviously, got to be careful of uh, leverage in, in that sense as well. And um, you know, people clearly, I think, uh, need to be understand what they're doing, uh, yeah. particularly with things like options that are very non-linear. Yeah, it's definitely slightly more risky. Anthony, is this something that people shouldn't be trying at home? Yeah, I don't think they should. I think it's, I think it's too tough. I mean, if GameStop hasn't scared you off, nothing will, I guess. <laughs> uh, um, and with options, yes, I agree, you can limit your downside with, uh, with put options, but you've got to get your timing perfect. The only, usually the only people who win out of options are the market makers, but yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, obviously, uh, if you get a, a short wrong, it becomes a bigger and bigger problem. If you get a long wrong, it sort of corrects itself through time a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so you need to be just on top of your portfolio on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, and last question. What sector are you seeing a lot of shorting opportunities in at the moment? In yeah. your mind, could this be like the next big short? Uh, well, we, we do run shorts right across the market. One where we don't actually have shorts at the moment that we're thinking about um, whether it's time to start putting some on is uh, within resources in the iron ore space. So it's been one of the, the strongest parts of the market. It's probably a bit of a contrarian short. Um, yeah, the iron ore price has been very strong with um, Vale and Brazil. Dam collapses really impacted the supply side. China's been stimulating very strong. Those things are starting to change. Vale is steadily getting its production back up. China's starting to tighten down on um, its stimulus, tightening financial conditions and uh, bringing back um, uh, stimulus for steel production. So that could be approaching a bit of a peak and these things go in very broad cycles. So we're looking at that as a, you know, an area, some of the big uh, iron ore producers, maybe Fortescue Rare, uh, Mineral Resources, whether it's time to uh, look at shorts on that side. Yeah, it's really interesting. Anthony, your time in the hot seat. Yeah. What is a area where you're seeing a lot of shorting opportunities at the moment? I think COVID winners. I think because what's happened in the uh, over the last year is there's been a lot of you know, winners where uh, you know whether it be sort of e-commerce, um, uh, a lot of sort of discretionary retailers, etc., where the share prices are reflecting that the good times for the COVID winners uh, are going to last forever. We generally think that. Um, that people are going to shift their consumption away from buying stuff to buying experiences over time. And so as that happens, you might see uh, some sort of negative like for likes in, I guess, some of the winners like discretionary retail. Well, that's all we have time for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you never miss an update.